Hi, everybody, and welcome to Exegetically Speaking, a podcast to the friends and faculty of Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois, and the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas. My name is David Capes, and I am the Senior Research Fellow at the Lanier Theological Library and a former dean up there in Wheaton at the School of Biblical and Theological Studies. Our purpose in these podcasts is really very simple. We want to promote the study of biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, so we can read the Bible more faithfully, study it more fully, and not just read it, but to live it. It's a pleasure today to welcome Dr. John Walton back to Exegetically Speaking. He's a professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College, been on a number of times to talk about Genesis and Daniel and lots of other great topics. Dr. Walton, good to see you. John. Great to be here, always. <laughs> I'm glad to see you. It, it's, it's a delight. Now, you, you are working on, uh, the big project you're working on is a, is a commentary on Daniel, right? Tell me a little bit about that. It is. It's, it's for Erdman's New International Commentary series, and I'm working with my colleague, Dr. Aubrey Buster, hmm. and we're just having a grand time with it. The interesting things, because of my training, I'm able to provide a lot of the comparative studies, Babylonian setting, things that really haven't been brought out in lots of commentaries. And with her background, she's able to bring lots of the social sciences to, to the table, things about memory and reciprocity and commensality and things that are really important topics that show up very significantly in Daniel. So between the two of us, we feel like we're making a contribution to Daniel studies that just hasn't been showing up in commentaries in recent years. So two heads are better than one then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And this is going to be a substantial commentary. Any idea about when it's going to be out? I know it's hard to predict these things, but... Yeah, uh, we're thinking probably end of 2024. Okay. Well, that, that, that's pretty good progress on, on a beefy commentary like that. It's an important book, not only in the Old Testament, but it becomes a very important kind of text that bears a lot of reflection in the New Testament as well. Right. A lot of appropriation and reception in New Testament. Now, today we're going to talk about Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, which is a, a common text. People probably know it, but maybe they don't know it exactly the right way. So tell us a little bit about what do we need to know about Genesis three sixteen, John? Well, this is a section that is traditionally referred to as the curse. Mm. It's about the woman's difficulties in childbearing and then the relationship between the wife and husband. Uh, so it also comes into play in lots of the discussions about gender roles. Uh, it's seen as sort of a seminal passage to that kind of conversation. Mm. But there are an awful lot of things that are arguable, disputable about this text that make it a very interesting text. Uh, one of the first things to mention is we call it the curse, but man and woman are not cursed. The serpent is cursed and the ground is cursed, but mm. man and woman are not and therefore, I'm reluctant to label it curse and even question whether we should think of it as punishment. So if, if we don't think of it as curse or punishment, how should we see it? Yeah, I see it more as a parental declaration. That is God saying, you've chosen your way. You've chosen to do things your own way. And there are going to be not only the penalty of death that you will experience, but mm. there will be other consequences. And not all consequences are punishments. Mm. And so I think we have to think in terms of these are consequences, the implications of what they will face in this new scenario that they have chosen for themselves. So it's like they've grown up, they've gone through adolescence, and they've chosen their own way. And boy, in choosing that way, they've also chosen some some bad consequences. If you crash the family car and your parents say, you're grounded, that's punishment. Yeah. But if they say, your insurance rates are going to go up, that's not punishment. That's consequences. <laughs> exactly. I'm reminded of that passage in Romans that said, well, God gave them up to, you mm -hmm. know, God gave them over to, right. you know, these kinds right. of consequences that would, that would come their way. So, okay, it's, it's not a curse. It's not punishment. It's just sort of the, the consequences that a parent is saying that mm -hmm. this is what's going to happen. And right. any loving parent is going to sort of say that to their sons or daughters who go their own way. Now, they've chosen to make order for themselves. That's how I see chapter three. Mm. God wanted them to work alongside of him to bring about his order. That's what image of God is about. They decided, no, we want order our way on our terms for our benefits. 
Mm. And now God is sending them out into the less ordered world outside the garden to see how they do. It's kind of like the father and the prodigal son sending the prodigal son off into the world. You've chosen this mm-hmm. and you're you're going to have the consequences. Exactly. Now there's that this part of the text that says to the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. That's the one translation. Yeah. And that's problematic. First of all, as any Hebrew scholar would tell you, that word translated childbearing is the word conception. It's not the bearing of the child. Right. It's conception. And that poses a potential problem because there's no pain in conception. Mm. So Mm. translators have gone for childbearing instead of conception, where really they should be looking at that word for pain. I think the word for pain has more to do with anxiety. Mm -hmm. Physical pain can cause anxiety, but there are plenty of other causes for anxiety, especially in the ancient world. Conception is an issue of great anxiety because if a woman could not conceive, she could be dismissed from the household summarily. No questions asked, no paperwork. Uh, she's just, <laughs> she can just yeah. be sent out. That was just the way of the world, right? There's a lot of anxiety about conception. Mm. And of course, the anxiety continues all the way through the childbearing process. The question is about, will I carry the child to term? Will the child survive childbirth? Will I survive childbirth? Mm. All matters of very deep anxiety. So I would say this should be better translated that I will increase your anxiety, of course, because now they're dependent on themselves. Hmm. Increase your anxiety in conception all the way through childbirth. Hmm. Just the whole process of child rearing, even too. I mean, rearing children, you never know exactly how they're going to turn out, right? Right. But this only tracks it up to childbirth, that second clause. Yeah. The first one talks about conception. The second one talks about actually giving birth to the child. Okay. So that nine months is is anxiety filled. And that's the setting for this verse. And so in that phrase, in pain you shall bring forth children. Is that the pain of childbirth? Or is that uh, another kind of pain? It includes the physical pain of childbirth. But I think, again, it more broadly talks about the anxiety that surrounds childbirth. Mm -hmm. Uh, Labor pains are are bad enough. But again, in the ancient world where you have high child mortality and even high mother mortality, Mm -hmm. the moment of birth is often the moment of death. And so there's anxiety that surrounds that as well that goes far beyond the pains of labor pains. Mm -hmm. There's another section of that where it says your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Right. And that's where the gender roles often come into play. Now that word desire, uh, you know, we're talking about exegesis. So Hebrew Mm -hmm. words here, that word desire only occurs two other times. And it's very difficult Mm. to give it nuance. Uh, What kind of desire is it? Some of the translations specify that. So with some of the translations like ESV, they say your desire will be contrary to your husband. And NLT says that your your desire will be to control your husband. Those are highly interpretive and I think highly arguable. The desire is basically an, an instinct, an impulse, an inclination. And there's nothing essential about control or contrariety connected to it. Mm. So in these times of uncertainty, of threat, of jeopardy, of anxiety, her desire will naturally turn to her husband for support. You see the childbearing, the anxiety in in conception and bringing forth children related to that passage about desire for husband. Exactly. In other words, she'll turn to her husband in the middle of this anxiety. And and that would be normal and natural? Yes, that's very natural for her to do. Hmm. She wants support. And it's natural that she should look to her husband for that support in all of that anxiety, that feeling that there's no order, there's chaos, everything's falling apart. This is so devastatingly threatening. So all of that, she turns to her husband. So her desire will be toward her husband. We also sometimes read that last verb, he will rule over her. Yes, yes. It's like a punishment. You know, it's, it's, you've heard it said that since the woman led the husband into sin by giving him the apple, the fruit, not an apple, of course, that therefore he will be in a ruling position. But that doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Rule in the ancient world was considered essential for order, for structure, for social 
order to work. And mm -hmm. it's almost always benevolent. God is the one who rules. Kings rule, and even though there are bad kings, they bring structure and order to society. Mm -hmm. And so ruling is generally benevolent and desirable. So when it says that he will rule over you, it's suggesting that he will provide order benevolently, theoretically. Again, that's not always the case. Mm. That's what this passage is referring to, the fact that he will give that support. I guess that represents a kind of an ideal, right, of, of the fam yes. family structure at that point. Right. So bottom line to this, I mean, what do you think this passage? Not a curse, it's not a punishment, just the natural consequences of your choices that you've made? Yes. So it does not dictate an ontologically inferior position for women. It's not punishing women for what took place earlier in the chapter. Mm. Uh, so we really can't read something about gender roles from this, that this is how the family is supposed to be from this passage. We go to other passages, but this is how the church is supposed to be, or this is how humanity is supposed to be, and this is God's imposing of punishment. None of that pans out when we take a careful look at the words that are used. And of course, that's what exegesis asks us to do. Mm. To take a real deep dive into the text. Dr. John Walton, thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. My pleasure. Thanks to Ian Rosine, Rebecca Larson, and Silvio Vasquez, who helped us produce this podcast. Thanks as well to John Lanzma, our Wheaton-based director, who makes this podcast possible. We're grateful to Phil Keggy for our music. If you want to study biblical languages, then you need to consider Wheaton College. Whether you're an undergraduate or a graduate student, we have amazing programs, a first-rate faculty, and some of the best students in the world. So go to the website, www.wheaton.edu, and look for modern and classical languages. Get started today. If you have questions about this or any of our podcasts, we'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions or questions about any passage in the Hebrew Bible or Greek New Testament, send us an email and we'll see if we can get one of our experts to weigh in on that for you. Our email is exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. That's exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks for listening. <laughs>